My Lords, we now come to the second oral question. Baroness Ainley of St John's. My Lords, I beg leave to put the question standing in my name on the order paper. Minister Lord Armit of Gwynedd. My Lords, we are marking International Human Rights Day with activities in the United Kingdom and overseas. My right hon. Friend, the Foreign Secretary, will have more to say on our plans later today, and tomorrow I will be hosting an event with human rights groups. We fully support this year's UN theme of ensuring human rights are central to COVID-19's recovery efforts. The pandemic has exacerbated many global challenges, underscoring the need for British leadership to protect, promote and indeed strengthen human rights, and we are committed to acting as a force for good in the world. Baroness Ailey. My Lords, sir. Human rights defenders are the most effective partners for achieving sustainable human rights change. So uh, will my noble friend ensure support for them will now be built, built into all FCDO priority campaigns? And will he consider committing to a strategic approach to support human rights defenders as exists already for other human rights work? My noble friend makes a very important point, and I share her view that human rights defenders actually go across all pillars of human rights priorities. And indeed, earlier this week, I had a very constructive meeting with Amnesty International on this very issue. And I assure my noble friend I am looking towards our key partners in that sphere to see how we can strengthen the various human rights pillars, whether it's media freedom, freedom of religion, uh, uh, gender-based violence. There are so many different areas, LGBT rights, where human rights defenders play a brave role in the field, and it is right that we defend them. Lord Cashman. My Lords, today is International Human Rights Day, but not for trans people. In the United Kingdom, trans women and trans men face unrelenting organised attacks, defamation and blatant misrepresentation, which has created a climate of fear sadly whipped up by some members of your Lordship's house. The attack is now on trans teenagers and their parents. So will the Noble Lord, the Minister, discuss with other ministerial colleagues across government what legal protections can be afforded to trans people in the United Kingdom to allow them to live their lives without fear or harm and enjoying their human rights? The Noble Lord highlights a very disturbing uh, issue, and it is right that when we go out and defend human rights, and particularly the rights of LG, uh, LGBT community that we stand up for rights at home. I'll certainly take forward the concerns if there's particular issues or cases he is aware of. I would ask him to both write into myself and my noble friend, uh, the Minister of State for the Home Office. But let me assure him internationally, as co-chairs of the Equal Rights Coalition alongside Argentina, we are sharing best practice and promoting LGBT rights equality globally. And in even countries such as Pakistan, we've actually seen transgender legislation being brought forward, which is encouraging for a country which is substantially challenged in a whole range of human rights. Baroness Hodgson of Abinger. Will the no noble lord, the minister, agree with me that it is often women and children who bear the brunt of day-to-day -day human rights abuses, especially during conflict? COVID has contributed to putting women in more danger of being abused and their rights being pushed back. So it is imperative that the excellent UK work on PSVI and Women, Peace and Security continues. So can my noble friend, the minister, confirm that gender issues and putting women and girls at the heart of international development, beyond just education, worthy though that is, will remain central to the work of the Merge Department and decreased aid budget? Um, in the interest of brevity, the short answer to my noble friend is absolutely. Issues of PSVI, women, peace and security are central to our thinking, and we have raised these particular issues and priorities, including ICANN's support for the protection framework for women mediators. They will be central to our work in places such as Yemen, Afghanistan and South Sudan. The Earl of Sandwich. May I first thank the Minister for what he does for human rights every day. And does he share my concern about continuing discrimination in India against Muslims, Christians and other minorities such as the Dalits and Adivasis and the impact this has on India's international status and Commonwealth profile? Is there anything the FCDO has done or can still do about this? My Lords, let me... Uh confirmed to the Noble Earl, we raise human rights concerns across the globe and we have very constructive 
uh, re relations with India, and in that nature, we do raise our candid concerns about issues of human rights within India. I can assure you the issue of human rights, particularly freedom of religion, is enshrined in the Indian constitution, and we continue to engage very constructively on this agenda with India. Lord Anderson of Swansea. My Lord, I commend the commitment of the Minister in this field and also of his predecessor, Baroness Annele. Could he say whether he agrees that there is great value in giving young people an appreciation of the importance of human rights? And to that end, would he therefore consider re relevant educational initiatives, such as including a human rights component in curriculums and encouraging schools to invite speakers with a, a known human rights commitment to speak to them, uh, particularly those, of course, with personal experience of human rights violations. I thank the noble Lord for his kind words and indeed join him in tribute to my predecessor in this role, who played a vital role um, on a whole range of human rights priorities. A very practical suggestion, and what I can assure the noble Lord, I will take that back and write to my opposite number within the Department of Education to see how we can best take that forward. Baroness Northover. My Lords, the noble Lord will have read the concluding statements from Andy Hayne, Consul General in Hong Kong, on the restriction on dissent that he's seen. Um, over his time there and the fundamental changes this has brought about in Hong Kong. What chance does the noble Lord the Minister see for the continuation of the vital independence of the judiciary there? My Lord, the noble lady and I have exchanged uh, many a conversation on this issue. Of course, the instigation of the national security laws has caused great concern, including the appointment of judges, which now sits with the chief executive. It is a concern. Of what the future holds, I, I cannot say. It would be mere speculation. But of what is important, we remind the Hong Kong authorities about the importance of the independence of the judiciary continuously. Baroness Hellig. My Lords, as we mark Human Rights Day, hundreds of political prisoners, many of them women, are incarcerated by our ally and trade partner, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. One of them is Lojan al Hatlo, in prison since May 2018, and as I am speaking, she is appearing in front of a terrorism court in Saudi Arabia. I know the government has raised the case with the government of Saudi Arabia, but can the my noble friend tell the House what answer was received and what steps will be taken next? And will ministers use the opportunity of a new administration in the United States to actively work to secure Ms. al Hatlou's release and the release of other activists like her? My Lords, I share the noble lady's concern, and we continuously, as I have and my right honourable friend, the Minister for Middle East and North Africa, have on the issue of human rights defenders, particularly women human rights defenders. There are at least five women human rights defenders who remain in detention in Saudi Arabia, and we do raise these cases. A practical suggestion, again, with the new administration coming in, we look to see how we can continue to work constructively with Saudi Arabia on raising these concerns on a regular and consistent basis. Lord Collins of Highbury. My Lords, if I could just follow up on the question from the Noble Lady Baroness Hodgson and the Noble Lord's response uh, on sexual violence. The 2020 report of the UN Secretary General found that domestic legislation in many countries meant that justice was still too often not served. Can the Noble Lord, the Minister, tell us what his department is doing? Is it offering technical support to countries, either multilaterally or bilaterally, to address this issue? As the Prime Minister's um, representative on PSVI, this is an issue very close to my heart, and I assure him we are looking at all elements, including technical support, because as we move out of conflict, that is when the laws, regulations and constitutions of countries are created. They must be all-inclusive, and that's why women mediators in particular have to be central and pivotal to that cause. Lord Wolfe. My Lords, I hope you can hear me. I refer to my interests disclosed in the register and ask the noble minister whether he agrees with me that the reason this country should wholeheartedly support this United Nations International Human Rights Day is that this country's unwritten constitution has developed the observance of the rule of law and human rights and has become increasingly critical of efforts to restrict their applicability. 
At this juncture, I would say I totally agree with the noble and learned law, and it's, uh, we're proud of our traditions in this respect. Lord Lee of Hurley. On 2nd of December, the UN General Assembly once again neglected the human rights repression by serial abusers like Iran, China and Russia and devoted an entire session to deriding Israel. The five resolutions voted on in this session are yet more distractions from tragedies unfolding in many countries, but unlike Canada and our other allies, the UK voted against only one of them. Does my noble friend the Minister agree with me that it's time for the UK to stand up not just against Item 7, but against oppressive regimes by introducing resolutions that condemn human rights abuses? I agree with my noble friend totally in terms of that we need to consider and show leadership on uh, resolutions against repressive regimes. Uh, he's right to raise the issue of the Human Rights Council in Article 7. We have seen a change. Uh, incremental, and I feel very strongly on a personal level that where there are particularly resolutions of a technical nature, they need to be looked at. This isn't about just creating bureaucracy, it's about creating change and effective change on the ground. And we must hold regimes, wherever they are in the world, repressive towards human rights to account and make sure the perpetrators of crimes are brought to justice.